True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. So way back on July 2nd, 1970, tourists visiting Lockard Gorge, Australia, found a crashed car teetering on the edge of an oceanside cliff. It looked like the car could plunge into the water at any moment. After investigators were called to the scene, the mystery grew deeper. The car's license plate was traced to a family living over 100 miles away. Once the car was towed from the cliff's edge, the inside was inspected. Investigators were horrified to find four dead bodies, including three young children inside. The back seat of the car had been removed and someone had attached a hose leading from the tailpipe to the front window, suggesting a suicide. This find, this find sent waves of grief and confusion throughout Australia. There were so many questions and so very few answers. Join us at the quiet end for Fugitive Father, a conversation about a terrible crime which has become an enduring mystery. The victims in the car were identified as members of the Crawford family from 136 Cardinal Road, but the father was missing. So it seemed possible that the father, Elmer, Elmer Crawford, had been thrown from the vehicle in the crash. That is until witnesses came forward to say that they had seen Elmer after the car was found. So quite a mystery, quite a disturbing case. I'll give a warning here. <laughs> it is a disturbing case. I got to say that. Really disturbing. So let's do a beer. I'm going to drink some nice Australian beer. I picked a brewery called White Rabbit, and we're going to drink some White Rabbit Dark Ale. Uh, this is an English brown ale. It's only 4.9% alcohol by volume. So we can have a couple of these. All right. And it follows the, the script pretty much for a brown ale. It's cola colored, Coca-Cola colored, a thin beige head. Got an aroma of dark fruit and molasses. Taste follows the nose quite nicely. Dark fruit and molasses. There's a little late hops in this. Nice example of a brown. Uh, a little on the thin side. Kind of watery, but other than that, <laughs> very nice beer. Yeah, so I'm thinking usually when I hear about a beer with dark fruit and molasses, it's a high alcohol beer, but this is relatively low alcohol. Yes, it is. So that's where the thin comment comes in, huh? Right. Okay. Well, let's open it up. I'll drink some with you. Okay. All right, down here at the quiet end today, and you're going to start us off as usual. My pleasure. Thank you. So Teresa McManus grew up in a close-knit Catholic family, one of nine kids. Their home, which is in a suburb of Ipswich, was small but tidy. Nice little cottage. Her father, Jim, worked for Queensland Rail, and her mother, Jane, was a stay-at-home mom who was a skilled seamstress. And there's a lot of young families that lived in their neighborhood. So they all knew each other and they all spoke to one another. People thought nothing of running over to a neighbor's house to borrow some eggs or a tool or whatever. Everything seemed to balance out in the end. Now with 11 people living under a relatively small roof, privacy was hard to come by in Teresa's childhood home. I can imagine. <laughs> it's packed in. And this was especially challenging for the older children. Like in any family, there were some petty jealousies and disagreements. Nothing major. They, they get along pretty well. As the middle two girls, Teresa and her sister Vani, were especially close. They were practically inseparable for many years, sharing secrets and inside jokes. They were buds. They were best friends into adulthood, even though they would end up living thousands of miles apart. Yeah, now one of the negative things about life in Ipswich was the limited number of opportunities once the kids were grown up. The excitement and possibilities of other cities 
really drew them away from the family home. One sister moved to America, another to Sydney. A brother joined the Navy, and Teresa moved to Melbourne. And there, at age 21, she planned to make herself a new, more exciting life. Once in Melbourne, Teresa found a live-in job at a convalescent hospital, so she worked in the kitchen and the dining room, quickly becoming well-liked for her outgoing, caring, and really cheery personality. She made friends easily and became known as Terry. Teresa made one really close friend, Mavis, and these two young women especially loved to go out dancing. So at every opportunity, they went out to the local dances. Teresa's favorite dances were the Irish ones. Melbourne's large Irish community put on some of the most festive social events. And it was at one of these dances where Teresa met and fell in love with a man six years older than her. And although he seemed more reserved than the men Teresa was usually attracted to, her friend Mavis did approve of this match. So the romance moved quickly, and Teresa found herself pregnant out of wedlock. If this were found out by her family, she would face a great deal of shame. But the baby's father, Elmer Kyle Crawford, wanted to marry Teresa. They had a rushed wedding on February 20th, 1957. She knew that there was no turning back after that, but she was happy at the time not to be a spinster, or worse yet, an unwed mother. A lot of stigma with that. Oh, absolutely. Especially in the Catholic faith. Exactly. So her husband, Elmer, had been born to an unmarried mother himself. This was Anna Beatrice Crawford, and he was born in Canada. Short time after he was born, his mother took him back to her hometown in Northern Ireland. And then there she left him in the care of her parents and siblings, and she returned to Canada on her own. So Elmer's raised by his grandparents, and he's got cousins and people around to play with. He was remembered as a quiet kid, never finished school. When he was 22, he emigrated to Melbourne by ship. Yeah, Elmer had some handyman skills, and he used them to get work at the Victoria Racing Club. He had no formal certificates or training, but he was talented enough to be promoted to electrician within a year. Although he was still very quiet, he was considered friendly enough. He was a competent and reliable worker, but he was known to be very tight with his money, which is understandable because he grew up without any, I would imagine. He had very little, yeah. Yeah. Now, after Elmer and Teresa got together, Elmer bought land on Cardinal Road in the Melbourne suburb, suburb of Glenroy, and that's where he built the family home. He did most of the work himself, but it was far from fancy. Still, it was enough for Teresa she was happy, and their first child, Catherine, was born there in 1958. The Crawfords seemed like most families in their suburb, too. Most of their neighbors were young families, and Teresa was very well-liked. Unlike Elmer, she was very warm and approachable, and able to form some strong friendships with the other women in the community. So it looks like uh, Teresa was the more popular of the couple, but Elmer was popular, too. And that was mostly because he was always willing to help out. He'd do odd jobs, uh, electrical wiring, phone installations. He had a large collection of tools, which he would lend out happily. And for similar reasons, the neighborhood kids were fond of Elmer, as he was often tinkering in his garage, didn't mind fixing flat tires or giving rides on his motor scooter. So, family's doing okay. Looks like a nice, settled suburban family. Well, you know, he was a little standoffish, but, you know, if the kids' bikes broke down or anything, they could take them right to Elmer's garage, and he was okay about fixing it and just kind of helping out. Mm -hmm. So maybe not the warmest fellow, but he seemed like a good guy. Yeah. So then in 1962, Elmer and Teresa's second child, a boy named James, was born. Two years later, they had another daughter, Karen. After Karen's birth, Teresa suffered from what was most likely postpartum depression. But at the time, that wasn't really that well known, and they called it a nervous breakdown. She would cry just seemingly out of nowhere, and when she wasn't in tears, she was sleeping or lying in bed just feeling very hopeless. 
so at a loss for what to do, Elmer paid for her parents to come and visit. So they stayed and helped with the children while Teresa recovered. And after about three months, she was feeling better and got back to her normal self. But Elmer put his foot down after that and said they wouldn't have any more children. He didn't want to go through that again. Although they had been very strict Catholics, Elmer arranged for her to take contraceptives to prevent any more pregnancies. Now, Elmer was a devoted father and a good provider, but he could be kind of antisocial. He didn't attend neighborhood barbecues or parties, and the only couple who socialized with Teresa and Elmer were Mavis Bryant and her husband. Now, they too would describe Elmer as quiet, but they had also witnessed a very short fuse and an explosive temper. Teresa wasn't passive about it either, and she was known to incite him. He rarely took the bait, at least not in front of company. He'd usually just change the subject or walk away. But when he did lose his temper, it could be kind of scary. Yeah, he could really erupt. He could. So their neighborhood was definitely working-class neighborhood. Crawfords, however, never wanted for anything. Viewed from the outside, their house at 136 Cardinal Road was an average home. Furnishings were modest. But Elmer's garage, holy cow, was very well equipped with all of the expensive tools of a professional tradesman. Teresa also had some things which her friends could never afford, like an electric knitting machine. So for someone earning what Elmer earned, he had a lot of possessions. Besides that, he had nearly paid off his house, and he owned three other lots in Queensland. He told people that the three lots were for his kids. Right, when they grew up, they could have their house there. Right. His car, his motor scooter, and the family's caravan were all paid for, and he still had over $7,000 set aside in bank accounts. At that time, it was a small fortune. Yes, especially for a working-class dad. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of money for anyone, really. And back in 1970, or in the 60s, yeah, he had a lot of money set aside. That he did. But still, Teresa was cautious about asking Elmer for money. What he would do is he gave her a household allowance, and if she spent more than that, he'd become furious. He saw any overspending by his wife as wastefulness and incompetence. Now he knew how to manage his money, he thought, and he expected her to be able to do the same. But in fact, Elmer was a schemer. He was always scheming and thinking up ways to make some extra cash. He spent time in his garage preparing stolen goods for sale. And he became well known at all of the pawn and resale shops around Melbourne, where they never even questioned him. So on a regular basis, he would take in spools of copper, nice tools, electrical supplies, and even clothing to exchange for cash, and then he would suck that money away. Another source of additional income for Elmer was his second job that he took as a parking attendant down at the horse track. Now, he collected parking fees there, but over several years, he stole thousands of dollars in change. He would brag to the Bryants about how smart he was and how his employer was just too stupid to find out what he was up to. And it did seem true because he was getting away with it. Now, one thing we don't know, though, is if Teresa knew about all of his illegal activities. It seems like she must have had some clue, but it also seemed like she turned a blind eye to it. And that could have been out of fear. She was in a situation where she really didn't feel like she could stand up to him or leave. She had babies with him, and he was the one with the income. Right. And this was income that she wasn't really privy to. No, she got an allowance. Yeah. So Elmer took a vacation from work in late June of 1970. On his last Saturday night at the racetrack, he took the cash from the parking fees to the administration office, and this is where a man named Gary Newell was counting up the night's income. Newell asked Elmer if he was going away on holiday, and Elmer said he wasn't sure because the kids did have school. For the first time since Newell had known him, Elmer made conversation with him, and he told Newell that he had bought his daughter Catherine a new piano, he seemed proud of that. So the kids did have a school holiday, which overlapped with most of Elmer's vacation days. 
Catherine, the oldest, was invited to New South Wales to visit her uncle. That was Teresa's brother, who owned a farm with horses. But Alma refused to let her go, which was really weird. Teresa and Catherine didn't understand why. But he was the boss in that family, and his decisions were final, so they really didn't even argue. No, this was despite him pretty much always saying, sure, go ahead and do it. Yeah, I mean, there was no reason for him not to want her to go. Yeah. But he already had plans in motion. Unfortunately, that seems to be the case of why he said, no, you can't go. He wanted her to be there. So Elmer started his first vacation day by doing major cleaning around the property. He burned piles of garbage, drove carloads of junk to the local dump, he did other work around the house. He told neighbors that he was raising the garage roof so he could fit the caravan, which had been kept parked in the yard for years. Uh, he's going to fit that inside. He'd always been considerate to the neighbors when it came to doing loud work, especially because a citadel that belonged to the Salvation Army was just down the street. But now, with this latest fixer-upper scheme, he didn't <laughs> seem to care. He used his power tools late at night, every night of that week. The Salvation Army had always seen the Crawfords as good neighbors, but Elmer's new activities were disturbing to them and to the other neighbors. Yeah, one neighbor, Jennifer, stopped by the Crawford house on June 30th. She was bringing some soft drinks for the kids and to visit with Teresa. When she showed up, Elmer was pulling out of the driveway and his car was full of garbage. She was surprised to see him because she thought that his vacation was over and he should be back at work. Teresa was really happy to see Jennifer, but a little embarrassed and apologized because she didn't have money to repay her for the soft drinks. But the two women chatted for a while, and when Elmer returned, Jennifer said hello to him. She asked him how he was doing. He said all right, but, you know, typical Elmer, he didn't make any other conversation. When Jennifer left, she asked Teresa why Elmer wasn't back at work yet. And Teresa answered, I know, isn't it awful? He should have gone back a couple days ago. And she went on to tell Jennifer that Elmer had been kind of manic, cleaning up for days like a man on a mission. Which in retrospect is really creepy. But Jennifer was close enough to Teresa that she knew Teresa was pregnant for a fourth time. It had definitely been a surprise, but Teresa had seemed okay with it, like she'd come to terms with it. But when asked what her husband thought about it, she just said, oh, you know Elmer. But Jennifer did notice that Teresa had seemed uneasy about it, and Jennifer felt like Elmer probably wasn't very happy about this pregnancy. Remember, he'd put his foot down after the third child and said, no more kids. Not that it should have been his decision, you know, alone. But right. that's how he saw it, I'm sure. And I'm sure he wasn't happy. Chris Teresa's a Catholic, and she's accepted that she's going to have a baby. Well, yeah. That's what you do. Well, that's what was done, absolutely. And, she, you know, she didn't want to have an abortion. I think she wanted to have the child, despite the issues. They could afford it. Mm -hmm. But she would, you know, possibly have some postpartum depression. It would be something that would have to be taken care of. But still, she seemed to be okay with it. And also that June 30th, Maureen Hayes from the McNair Survey Company came by the Crawford house, house. She wanted to ask if they would participate in a TV viewing survey. I guess that's sort of like the Nielsen ratings here. Yeah. The house had a TV antenna and the caravan out front meant that a family likely lived there. Ideal for her survey. Yeah. As she approached the house, Elmer was working in the trunk of an older model pink and cream-colored car parked in the driveway. The trunk was empty, and the back seat was out of the car, gone. Elmer gave her his name and family details, including the ages of his kids. He told her he was 42, his wife was 35. The children were 13, 8, and 6. Now, Maureen gave Elmer a diary to record what the family watched and said she would return on July 8th to pick up the completed form, to pick up the completed book. Elmer agreed and went back to work on the car. 
Yeah, so this is kind of olden days stuff where they would actually fill out a diary of what they watched. There was no electronic way to <laughs> determine this. Right. So that's kind of interesting. But Elmer had been very pleasant. Now, Elmer had been expected back at work on Wednesday, July 1st, and when he didn't show up, his employers were not happy. They actually waited for several hours, and then one of his co-workers was sent out to check on him. This was at lunchtime. So Kenneth Franklin, a mechanic from Elmer's workplace, had worked with Elmer for 16 years, so he knew him pretty well. And he thought that Elmer was a really good family man and an excellent co-worker. When he drove the 15 to 20 minutes out to the Crawford home, he was really kind of happy just to get out of the workshop for a while. I've been there. You have a job that, you know, is okay, but you don't love it. And any chance you get to leave is always nice. Oh, yeah. I used to like that on the pediatric unit. I would go do home visits. And that was one of my favorite things because, of course, I would stop at Dunkin' Donuts, get a coffee, visit with the people. It was just a nice break from the usual grind. So that's how Kenneth was thinking. Because he really expected that Elmer had just mixed up his return date, he really had no concerns at that point. So he got out to the house about 1.30 p.m. and he saw the caravan out front. But the car wasn't in the driveway. The house seemed really quiet and the garage doors were chained shut, too. Elmer had told him that he wasn't going away for his vacation, so Franklin had really expected him to be there. So he knocked on the front door, but no one answered. Then he left, still not especially concerned, but was going back to work to report that he wasn't at home. Yeah, but Elmer's manager took his absence a lot more seriously. Elmer had worked there for years and was always reliable and on time, so not being there was certainly out of character for him. At 2.45 in the afternoon, the manager sent Franklin back to the Crawford home. Franklin arrived at the house again and knocked at the door. He began to wonder if something could be wrong. Whether it was a family emergency or maybe one of the kids got sick, Franklin figured that Elmer had a good reason for missing work. Yeah, and these are the days before cell phones when, you know, sometimes you were just out of touch with people. Yeah. It wasn't like people were always instantly available for you to contact. No. But still, it was kind of weird. He knew that. So the next day, July 2nd, was a regular school day in Glenroy. And that morning at 8.30 a.m., Brenda Connor said goodbye to her mother and headed out the door. As usual, she headed up Cardinal Road to the house of her best friend, Catherine Crawford. For the last three days, she had stopped by the Crawford house to meet Catherine, and the two 13-year-olds would walk to school together. But this morning, she saw the caravan on the front lawn as usual, but the house seemed really, really quiet. Now, usually, there were the sounds of the radio or the TV, or Catherine's brother James would be hollering and running around. But now, it was just dead. It was Catherine's father who answered the door, too, which was really weird. Brenda had expected Catherine or her brother James or Mrs. Crawford. Now, to her, Mr. Crawford was kind of creepy, and she didn't know what to say when he opened the door only part way and stood there saying nothing and looking at her. So Brenda did her best. She said good morning, and she asked Mr. Crawford if Catherine was ready for school. But he answered that Catherine was sick and wouldn't be going to school that day. Brenda really wanted to ask what was wrong, but this man made her nervous, so she just thanked him and began walking to school alone. But as Brenda walked, things made less and less sense to her. She was thinking it over. You know, Catherine had been fine just the day before. She had to be really sick if she wasn't going to school because she really liked going to school. Then Brenda saw that Mr. Crawford was still standing at the door watching her as she walked away, and she actually felt some fear. She would say later that she had the sudden urge to run, but she walked as casually as she could away from the house. And then in a minute or two, she did hear the door slam shut. Then around noontime that day, Tourists David and Ellen Henry found a car on a rocky ledge about 200 feet below the coastal cliffs of Loch Ard Gorge in a rural area in Victoria. They'd been walking across the grass that led to the cliff edge when Ellen spotted what looked like tire tracks. The tracks looked fresh, and Ellen worried about why someone would drive so close to the edge. 
treads made a path to the point where the ground began to slope toward the cliff's end. They came to an abrupt end at the cliff's edge. Alan called out to David and pointed out the tracks. Yeah, so careful not to get too close to the edge, they both looked down and Ellen pointed to a smashed car that was practically dangling off the side of a small ledge just feet above the ocean. The car was balanced just over the ocean water, resting on a layer of crumbling limestone. Now it appeared to have been driven or pushed off of the cliff above. Debris was scattered on the ledge and the driver's side door was hanging open. It looked like one big wave could have sent it into the ocean. So when the police and rescue workers arrived, they examined the car as best they could to see if there were any injured people inside. By the time a member of the rescue squad was able to descend down to the car, daylight was fading away quickly. There wasn't enough time to do a thorough examination, but he recovered items from the front seat and the area around the car. And one thing he found was a loaded rifle, so that was a bit worrisome. But it was decided that the that the search itself should be put off until the next morning. There was no sign of anyone being inside the car, so the car could be stabilized the next day and then lifted back up the cliff. But that night, the police went about finding the owner of that pink and white Holden sedan with license plate number HKU061. The car's registration led them to a modest brick house at 136 Cardinal Way in the Melbourne suburb of Glenroy. This was the Crawford family home. No crime had been reported in relation to the car, but the circumstances were very suspicious. The car was in Lockard Gorge, which is hundreds of miles from, Glen from Glenroy. Another very strange thing was that there was a hose taped to the car running from the exhaust pipe and into the passenger side window. Glenroy police sent a constable out to the Crawford house to speak to the car's owner. He showed up at the house in the evening of July 2nd, finding it dark and apparently unoccupied. So he knocked on the door and when he got no answer, he left. When the senior officials at the police department heard that no one had been home, they were very concerned. So they returned a second time. When no one answered, they entered the home. The two officers at the Cardinal Road address had found a partially open window in a bedroom. One of them climbed inside. In the dark, he could see only shapes of the furniture. So he found his way to the front door, let the other officer inside. When Please. one of them flicked on the light switch, they stopped cold. House was just absolutely covered in blood spatter. That'll get your attention, won't it? Yeah, I'm sure they were quite shocked. This was not something they were expecting. So it was a little after 10 o'clock in the evening when the officers entered the home. There were two twin beds in the room. It was Catherine and Karen's room. Both beds looked like they'd been slept in, but then horrible violence had happened. Mattresses and pillows were soaked in blood. The walls near the beds had streaks and spots of blood. A reading lamp had been unplugged from the wall. Yes, yeah, so these officers walked from room to room, checking for any victims or survivors. They found no one, but they did see a trail of blood leading from two of the bedrooms and into the kitchen. This house was an obvious crime scene, and homicide detectives were called to the scene. Detective Harry Morrison of the Homicide Squad arrived at the house about 11.30 p.m. Soon after, the house was full of police and forensic experts. There had likely been multiple homicides in this house. The front hallway was narrow and connected all of the rooms in the house, and it had blue high-pile carpet throughout the house, ending at the bathroom. But there was a trail of blood stains on that carpet. It looked like someone had tried to clean it, too, because the stains were noticeably wet. The girls' room with the two twin beds was photographed first. Investigators knew by then that the family had three children, Catherine, 13, Karen, 6, and James, 8. Each of the girls' headboards had recessed storage shelves. Catherine, the older girl, had a beauty case, some family photos, 
and a statue of the Virgin Mary. Karen's headboard had a picture of a cat, some stuffed animals, and picture books. But the police were kind of struck that these kids didn't have much for possessions. The rooms were pretty barren. Now, the parents' bedroom wasn't much bigger either. The door almost hit the double bed when it was opened, and the bed was already pushed up against a wall. There was a large wardrobe against another wall, and nearby shelves held neatly folded linens. On the other side of the wardrobe, there was a weird-looking electrical device. Now, on the floor, there was a pair of children's pajama pants and a woman's house coat. Both were stained with blood. Oddly, a reading lamp had been unplugged from the wall, just like it had been in the girls' room. The third bedroom belonging to eight-year-old James was neat with no signs of violence. His bed was unmade and appeared slept in, but it was otherwise very tidy. So was it possible that James had escaped the violence that had taken place in the house? They hoped so. One notable thing was that a reading lamp had been unplugged from the wall socket, just like in the other two bedrooms. There had to be something significant about the unplugged lamps, but the detectives didn't know exactly what that could be at that point. So the last room to be examined was the living room. On the fireplace mantel, there is a wedding ring and an engagement ring. Beside the fireplace, there is a vinyl chair with a pink cardigan lying on the seat. Under the cardigan was a handwritten letter written by Teresa to her older sister, Vani. And it was a sad letter. Teresa told her sister of her unhappiness at being pregnant, also that she knew it was too late to do anything about it. On the coffee table, there is a bottle of upholstery cleaner, and it had a brush on its cap covered with fibers that matched the blue carpet. Yeah, so it definitely looked like someone had tried to clean those stains on the carpet, which was not going to work. Not to the magnitude, or not given the magnitude of the blood. Right. Right? Yes, absolutely. Now outside, the police found a trail of blood drops leading from the back door to the garage. In the backyard, there was a black rubber hose lying with piles of old lumber. One end of the hose looked like it had been recently cut, and nearby there was a black section of the grass where there'd been a large bonfire. Two garbage cans next to the garage had blood stains on their lids, and inside one of them, there was a blood-stained piece of rope. Now, once they got inside the garage, which looked like a handyman's paradise, everything was neatly arranged and very organized. Against one wall, the rear seat of a car was propped up. The police already knew that the back seat was missing from the car off Lockard Gorge. So going through everything in the garage was tedious and time-consuming work, but it did pay off. They found a pruning saw with shreds of black rubber in its teeth and a glass jar that was full of alligator clips. So before we go over what was discovered in the Crawford's car, let's go over what is believed to have happened in the Crawford house on the evening of July 1st, 1970. Now, if you don't want to hear the gruesome details of these murders, you might want to fast forward about 15 minutes here. But, as always, we're not going to go in any more detail than we have to. No, we are not. So July 1st was a Wednesday, and at the Citadel next door to the Crawford House, the Salvation Army Choir was doing their practicing. One choir member who parked his car in the Citadel's front yard and walked toward the church noticed that an older model Holden sedan was parked near the front gate of the Crawford's house, and he'd never seen the car parked there before. The Crawford family was settling in for the evening after dinner. Teresa sat in her favorite chair by the fireplace. Karen had been sick with a toothache for two days, and she had kept Teresa up the night before. The three children were all in bed, and Teresa finally had a chance to relax. Elmer was out working in the garage. Teresa took her time alone to write a letter to her sister Vani, who lived a thousand miles away in Queensland. Yeah, it's actually believed that Teresa was still writing when Elmer entered through the back door. He came up quietly behind her and brought a thick rubber hose filled with lead down on her head, instantly knocking her unconscious. So Elmer dragged Teresa by her arms down the hallway and into the bedroom. He lifted her onto the bed and took two strange devices from his pocket. Each of these devices was a length of electrical wire 
with an alligator clip on one end and an electrical plug on the other end. He attached one clip to his wife's right earlobe and another to the skin between her thumb and forefinger. Then he plugged the other end of these two leads into a wall socket and turned on the power. Teresa was dead instantly. The electrified clips left burn marks on her skin with brownish streaks burned down her neck and down her arm. The fuses didn't blow because Elmer had already prepared for that. He'd replaced two of the fuses and exchanged the thin fuse wire with a length of electrical cable. Teresa, of course, was three months pregnant. So in doing this, he killed their unborn baby as well as his wife. So this seems very cold-blooded, to say the least. Well, and that's just the start. Yes. Now, once Elmer was satisfied that his wife was dead, he moved to his older daughter's bed. So 13-year-old Catherine was asleep when he smashed her skull with a ball-peen hammer. Blood soaked her bed and spattered onto the wall and onto her father. But Elmer struck her again in the center of her forehead. This strike drove bone fragments into her brain, and it's believed that he had struck her head so deeply that he had to work to wrench the hammer from her flesh. Now still, Elmer was not satisfied. He used another one of his crude electrical devices to electrocute his oldest daughter. Then Elmer moved to the other side of the bedroom, where six-year-old Karen was sleeping. Now she may have slept through her sister's murder because she was exhausted after suffering for two days with a toothache. Elmer hit Karen with the hammer on the right side of her head, and her skull was shattered. She died instantly. Elmer could see her brain through the gaping wound, so I guess that's why he didn't bother to electrocute her. In the third bedroom, James woke up. He walked out of his room, probably afraid from the noises he'd heard, and he headed to his parents' room. Elmer had wrapped the girls' bodies in bedding. Then he saw James walk past. Before James had time to realize that something horrible had happened to his mother, he was hit with a hammer blow to the side of his head. He was mortally wounded and fell to the ground. So Elmer took the leads from Teresa's body and used them to electrocute his only son. It's believed that Elmer took a minute to smoke a cigarette, then he snubbed out the butt on the bedroom floor. Then he finished wrapping his family's bodies in sheets and blankets. He dragged each body, one at a time, down the hallway, through the kitchen, and outside across the cement paving and into the garage. So at the Citadel, people did notice some odd sounds coming from the Crawford house, which was usually quiet at night. Two men heard more sounds at this point, which they agreed sounded like something heavy being dragged on the cement. Elmer put each of the bodies in the back of his Holden sedan where the back seat had been, and he covered the bodies with more bedding and a canvas tarp. And on top of the bodies, he loaded several plastic containers of gasoline, and his motor scooter was in the trunk of the car. So Elmer did know Lock Ard Gorge. This is located in the Port Campbell National Park. He had apparently spent time there, checking out the cliffs, looking for the most remote areas. In his mind, this was the ideal place to dispose of his family. And if the car hadn't landed on a ledge 200 feet below the cliff, he might have gotten away with it. Yeah, so just to me, what is he thinking? He's going to get rid of his family, clean up the house say the family's missing, and then just carry on in that house? Yeah. It seems like it, because otherwise, why wouldn't he just burn the house down or something? So it's just strange that he thought he was going to get rid of his family and get away with it. Well, and I'm not sure why he figured that driving it over the cliff into the water, and that's not a guarantee that the bodies are going to disappear forever. Well, no, and he took actions for that, right? He prepared it to look like there'd been a suicide, so he really wanted it to look like Teresa yeah. had beat the children, and then that's why the hose was taped to the car. Right. But we'll get into more of that. But it would have taken him about three hours to drive from his house to the gorge. Yeah. He was prepared if he was pulled over, too. He had a loaded twenty two rifle beneath a coat on the front seat of the car. So it seems like if a police officer was to pull him over... He was ready to shoot that officer. 
to get away with this because he had bodies in there with him. Other evidence he'd brought along included a cardboard box holding his electrocution devices, the hammer, some bank books, and family photo albums. He also brought snacks for the ride and some personal papers that he wanted to get rid of. There was also about 15 gallons of gas in the car, in containers, so he wouldn't have to stop at a gas station. So cut it, was, it, cut it all flat out. That's the thing. It was very planned. So by 9 p.m., Elmer was off on his way, and when he got to Port Campbell, he drove toward the Blowhole, which is a natural geyser and popular tourist attraction there. It was near the top of a cliff, which wasn't easily accessible, so he believed he would be able to dispose of all this evidence of his crimes and just leave his former life behind. Now, was the motivation here just because he didn't want a fourth child? Or would he have done this even if Teresa wasn't pregnant? That's a big question in my mind. Because everyone thought he was a good provider. Yeah, well, the, the depravity of the crime. He's going to get rid of the whole family. Regardless if she was pregnant, you mean? Yes. Okay. So he parked his car on the shoulder of the road, right in line with the cliffs over the blowhole. But he'd forgotten that there was a deep gutter that ran parallel to the road. The ground was soft from heavy rain, and he'd never be able to drive over that ditch in that little car. But thinking quickly, probably in a bit of a panic, he picked up rocks and pieces of limestone and filled the ditch with two sections as wide as the car's tires. So kind of a mini bridge. Yeah, it would, that would work, he hopes. Sure. So a few miles away... Uh, one of the local residents, Elaine Blair, was getting ready for bed. Uh, her house faced Loch Hard Gorge, and as she went to her window to close the curtains, she saw a set of headlights coming from the blowhole area. The lights were shining directly at her house, and she thought that was unusual for someone to be there at that time of night. But then she forgot about that and went to bed. Yeah, so from us here in the United States, we have to remember July in Australia is the middle of winter. So I would imagine he did it at that time because there wouldn't be as many tourists there. Oh, definitely. Because it was very cold, yes. But once he had that gutter filled up with stones to his satisfaction, he took his motor scooter out of the car's trunk because that would be his way home. Then he backed up the car and slowly drove it over this crudely built stone bridge. He carefully drove the car up the slight incline then, about 40 feet from the road, where the ground began to slope towards the cliff's edge, he got out of the car. When the car hit the cliff on its way down, the gasoline containers were supposed to burst open and spill inside the car. And the gas-soaked items in the car were meant to burn before sinking into the ocean. But Elmer had prepared for the remote chance that the car would be found in the future by staging it to look like the driver had committed suicide, meaning Teresa. Over time, the bodies would just be skeletons, he believed, and the only family members with skeletal injuries would be the three children. Because Teresa had died of electrocution, he believed it would look like she had murdered her children and then gassed herself before going off the cliff in her last moment of consciousness. To make sure seeds were planted to her being suicidal, Elmer planned to report his family missing once he got back to Glenroy. I don't like these plans. In what he's, way? He's going to get caught. Besides them being awful and evil? Or you don't think it's a successful plan? I don't think it's a successful plan. Well, no. It's a lot to think he's going to get away with, especially with so much blood in the house. Yeah. Even if the car goes into the ocean and he calls and says his family's missing, how's he supposed to cover up that crime scene in the home? That doesn't make a lot of sense. I know. There's no way he can clean it sufficiently that it would pass an inspection. You would think. So, yeah, you have to wonder about that. Well, as part of the setup, Elmer attached a rubber hose to the exhaust and ran it across the roof rack to the driver's side window. He rolled up the window to secure the hose, and he filled the gap with cloth bags. Then, in order to make sure that the car went over the cliff in a straight line, he tied a length of rope to the steering wheel, ran it through to the back of the car, holding it taut, then held it in place by slamming it in the trunk lid. So he's got like a couple reins, horse reins. Pretty much, yes. 
Now, there really was no noise when the car went over because the wind and the crashing waves were too loud. The car gained momentum as it headed down the slope to the edge, as Elmer watched it and probably felt quite pleased with himself. And he hadn't been sure that the gasoline would cause an explosion, so he wasn't particularly surprised or concerned when he didn't see a flash of light. He walked back to his motor scooter because he needed to get back to Melbourne and finish cleaning up the house before reporting his family missing. Still, he's going to have a tremendous cleanup job. Oh, absolutely. So back at the cliff the next day, sheep farmer and volunteer member of the Port Campbell Rescue Squad, George Cumming, was called to help with the car that had been found over the blowhole, which looked like it could have been a suicide. He met four other Rescue Squad members at the site, their vehicles loaded with ropes, stretchers, and first aid equipment. One of them drove a peg into the ground and attached one end of the rope to the peg and the other to George Cumming. Cumming made a safe descent down the face of the cliff to the rocky ledge. Now the ledge itself was only about 25 feet wide, and the surface was uneven with sandstone and limestone, so it was in a precarious position. The car was lying sideways on the ledge, and the front end was smashed in. At least one-third was actually hanging off the edge, and it was actually rocking in the wind. So, crazy. It really came close to getting into the ocean. You'd like to do the recovery on that vehicle, right? (laughs) Yeah, sounds terrifying. There was debris from the car, and that included electrical tape, a butter knife, some live twenty-two caliber cartridges and a little package of cookies for his ride. You know, he thought of everything. The front passenger window was broken. So Cumming peered inside and saw that the back seat was missing. Where it should have been, there was a tarp with bedding piled underneath. The ignition was in the on position, but there were no keys. When he opened the rear door, he was struck by a horrible odor. Now, he'd been working in search and rescue long enough to recognize that this was the smell of human death. So it's about 10.30 in the morning on July 3rd. The car had been stabilized and pulled onto a safer position on the ledge. It was left attached to a chain, which was attached to a tractor at the top of the cliff. So as workers reached in the back and lifted a corner of the tarp, they saw feet. They pulled the tarp further and saw three sets of feet amid a bloody mass of sheets, pajamas, and plastic containers. Yeah, I think the plastic containers had been filled with gasoline. Because, remember, he was hoping that the car would burn. Yes, like they do in the movies where the car goes over the cliff and on impact it just literally explodes. Exactly, yes. It doesn't usually happen that way in real life. No, it really doesn't. So the searchers moved to the driver's side and opened the door where they saw Teresa's body. A large car battery had fallen under her head, and as they removed the blankets, they saw a woman's body and the bodies of three children. It was obvious that the children had severe injuries. The four dead bodies were identified as Teresa Crawford and her children Catherine, Karen, and James. The bodies were moved on a stretcher, one at a time, up to the top of the cliff, Then the car was brought up. So can you imagine the police had to be really shocked? Oh, they must have been. I mean, it really didn't make sense what had happened at the Crawford home. What was going on? The family had been brutally murdered, and their bodies had been driven hundreds of miles away and pushed off a cliff in the family car. Now, importantly, the father was missing too, and now they knew that he had been seen at the house after the car's discovery. Now, this was a well-liked family who lived comfortably. From the outside looking in, this was a normal family. The planning that had gone into these killings became very clear to the police. It had been very carefully thought out. The killer wanted to make sure that the crime was never discovered. And Elmer did have a dark side, they learned. He was a thief with wealth out of place given his income from his two regular jobs. His wife may have known his sources of additional income, as well as some family friends. But Elmer never really showed off this wealth. The specifics of the family's financial situation were known only to the Crawfords, 
but their money did seem out of proportion to their circumstances, for sure. And then detectives learned that six years before her death, Teresa gave birth to her third and youngest child, Karen. The pregnancy and birth were traumatic, and Teresa suffered from severe postnatal depression after the birth. Until her death, Teresa had continued to take what neighbors described as nerve medicines. But with the help of friends and family, she did seem to have recovered, and she had resumed a normal life. Well, in regards to her pregnancy, Teresa had told her friends that both she and Elmer were excited about having another child, although she admitted that it had been a shock at first. But the real truth was more likely that Elmer had been furious when Teresa became pregnant for a fourth time. Not only had his wife failed to take the contraceptives as he had told her to, but she had hidden this from him. He had very negative memories of her breakdown after Karen's birth. Evidence found in the house, like Teresa's partially written letter to her sister and some newspaper clippings about abortion, pointed to Elmer telling his wife to have an abortion. Having grown up in a very strict Catholic family, Teresa probably never would have done that. In her letter to her sister Bonnie, Teresa had written about her worries about being pregnant, and she did mention Elmer's anger about it. She said it was too late and went on to express regret that the family's trip to Queensland that they'd planned for Christmas had to be canceled because now the baby was due in January of 1971. The newspaper clippings were found on the kitchen table and they were dated September 18, 1969. And they went into the negative aspects of abortions and unwanted pregnancies. There were actually two letters to the editor titled A Mother's Agony. The first was from a woman who became pregnant again six months after giving birth to twins. She and her husband were very poor and they couldn't afford to feed another baby. But they also couldn't afford a doctor who would be willing to perform an abortion either. Abortion was illegal at the time. So while the woman's husband was away, she had begged chemists for help and she'd spent all the money she could come up with on medication in the hope of causing a miscarriage. But she ended up almost killing herself in the process. She didn't miscarry, but she wrote that she had given birth to a child who never walked or talked and eventually was institutionalized. So the writer described how her life had been ruined. The second letter was from a woman who was against abortion, and in her letter she described it as an evil act. So obviously this was a topic going on between the couple in some way. Elmer Crawford did not want another mouth to feed at all. If he divorced Teresa, his thievery would be exposed, or he'd have to share some of it with her. It would mean years of child support payments, which he definitely didn't want to do. So he decided that he had to come up with a way of getting rid of his entire family without throwing any suspicion on himself. That's just not possible. No, it really isn't. And so something's missing with this guy, right? <laughs> I mean, that seems obvious to say, but something's really wrong with his mind that he can logically think that, oh, yes, I need to just get rid of my entire family mm -hmm. and then I'll be okay. Right. So what? Sociopath, I guess? Yeah. Psychopath? Something's seriously wrong with him. So Elmer had decided to make it look like Teresa had murdered their children and taken her own life. So not only was he going to kill his whole family, he was going to lay it all on Teresa. Leave her with a reputation as the woman who killed her kids. But his kids have other signs of injury to them. Right. But he's trying to make it look like Teresa did that. Okay. Apparently, that's why he didn't hit Teresa with the hammer. Right. Yeah. But that was only if they were found. I think he was feeling pretty much that they wouldn't be found. But he began planning what he thought would be the perfect murders. Disposal of the bodies was his biggest obstacle, though. He needed to find a very remote location where finding the bodies would be unlikely or would take years. So once the bodies were reduced to skeletal remains, he believed that the signs of his involvement would be totally gone. He thought of Port Campbell and Lockard Gorge, which was a favorite camping spot of his. It was in a remote part of Victoria, and... The area was kind of inaccessible to the average person. Unfortunately for Elmer, his plans were not successful. Car was found less than 24 hours after he pushed it off the cliff. Now, so 
he gets the car to go over the cliff, it's supposed to fall all the way into the water, and tides take it away. Exactly. Problem solved. Right. But he didn't know at the time that the car didn't go all the way down. Exactly, yes. In fact, his, his first inkling that something wasn't right was when a constable knocked on his front door. Oh, can you imagine the panic, <laughs> huh? He's in that well, house. There's blood everywhere. Yeah. I'm sure he's trying to clean the place up, right? Right. He's got a limited amount of time, or at least a seemingly limited amount of time to clean it. So, <laughs> yeah. That was when the first constable arrived, so... Then he probably just had to take off as quickly as possible and leave the mess, obviously. Because evidence does suggest that Elmer was at home when that first constable showed up. He would have been on alert, and if not for the delay in discovering the bodies inside the car, then the police would have stormed into the house and caught him that first night. But Elmer had been lucky in that way in that the constable left the house, giving him a chance to escape. The police found evidence that someone had been in the home after the crime had been committed. There was a partially eaten bowl of cereal and a cup of tea on the kitchen table. Another clue, of course, was that cleaning fluid and the wet carpeting. Elmer Crawford had begun to clean up the bloody mess inside of his house. Before any bodies were found but after the murders, Elmer was seen twice at the house. And that was his biggest mistake. That was the downfall. Without a doubt, it placed him at the house after the murders were committed. How could that be explained? He'd also told Catherine's friend Brenda that Catherine was sick and wouldn't be going to school. Neighbor Barb Smith saw him too. Now, Barb didn't know Elmer personally, but she knew the house. Her description of the man she saw standing at the end of the driveway matched Elmer to a T. He'd also been seen working on his car in the days leading up to the murders. Teresa's friend June Watson and that TV survey lady, Maureen Hayes, both noticed that Elmer had removed the back seat from that car. So the evidence is pointing squarely at Elmer as the killer, and he was the only suspect in the case. He did manage to escape, but his crimes were discovered, and then his plans to keep all of his money fell through. So it really kind of backfired on him. Well, it certainly didn't go the way he had planned it. No, no. Postmortem examinations were done on the bodies of Teresa, Catherine, James, and Karen. In cases such as the Crawford killings, where the physical appearance of the bodies is enough to rule out a natural cause of death, the postmortem examination documented precisely how each victim had died. A coroner's inquest done in July 1971 found that Elmer Crawford murdered his wife and children inside of the family home on Cardinal Road in Glenroy. He was last seen in his driveway on the same day the car was found, but he's been missing ever since. He was reportedly seen in Western Australia in 1994 by someone who had known him as an acquaintance. wasn't him. In 2008, a $100,000 reward was offered for information leading to his arrest, and that's gone unclaimed. Right. So then in July of 2010, newspapers reported that Elmer Crawford may have been found in San Angelo, Texas. A body had been in the morgue there since 2005, with fingerprints that had been deliberately damaged beyond recognition, and his identity was unknown. This man was found with several different IDs, but none were real, and his age was estimated to be between 75 and 80 years old. So this was connected to Elmer Crawford by an amateur investigator who'd been looking into the Doe Network, and this is a U.S.-based website that tracks missing people. So she saw a picture of this unidentified man in Texas, and she thought he looked a lot like the forensically aged photos of Elmer Crawford. Yeah, there are two primary methodologies used in facial recognition, geometric and photometric. So geometric compares facial features known as nodal points. This would include the distance between the eyes, width of the nose, the jawline, eye sockets. 
Photometric recognition uses algorithms that create a digital map of the face. Then the computer program compares it to other faces to look for a match. So photometrics considered to be about 90% accurate, but still variables like facial expressions and hair color can cause inaccuracies. So really, the only way to be 100% sure in identification is getting some DNA. Right, so that's what led to the Victoria Police looking for anyone who was a blood relative of Elmer Crawford. His brother William, who had also immigrated to Australia, had already died. Tricia Crawford, a British woman, claimed to be Elmer's biological daughter, and she also claimed that she had been abandoned by her biological mother. Her search for her father led her to Northern Ireland, where it was confirmed that Elmer was her father. When she contacted the police, she was told that her biological father was wanted for the murder of his entire family in Australia. So, wow, that's amazing. What would you think if you learned that? <laughs> that's not what you expect to find <laughs> out. It's supposed to be all snowflakes and bubbles and <laughs> nice things. Yeah, well, it certainly wasn't. So I guess she felt lucky then that he had abandoned her. Yeah, no kidding. Now, Betty, a woman living in Florida, had a distant relative in Australia who contacted her in 2000 and told her that Elmer Crawford was her half-brother. She searched, read a book about this case called Almost Perfect by Greg Fogarty, and contacted him, the author. It turned out that she had two cousins in Ireland. The family in Ireland and Betty's mother, Anna Beatrice Crawford, had never told Betty that Anna had given birth to Elmer in Canada and taken him back to Ireland for her family of origin to raise. Anna Crawford had died with this secret. But Betty was able to find some photos in her mother's home of a little boy with Elmer written on the back. Anna Crawford met and married an American when she was in Canada, and she'd moved to Florida with him, and that's where Betty had been born. But still, knowing all of that, the chances were very small that the body in the Texas morgue with no fingerprints was Elmer. Eventually, some DNA was taken, and the man in the morgue was determined not to be Elmer. Now, many had been really hopeful, but the victim's friends and family never got any real answers. Many consider this the longest-running murder mystery in Australian history. So, he wasn't able to keep his money, but Elmer did get away with this. So never been found. Saying, yeah. I mean, that's 53 years ago now. Yes. If Crawford is still alive, he'd now be 94 years old. So, remember John List? Uh-huh. He was found about 20 years after he committed a similar murder of all of his family members in New Jersey. But now it's really unlikely that Crawford will ever be caught, even if he is still alive. So he got away with murder for horrible, brutal, cold-blooded murders. You have to wonder what he did with the rest of his life, and if he hurt other people. Yeah, I know. You would think he'd lay low, try yeah, to keep a low profile. Because yeah. he, he wouldn't want any scrutiny into his life. Absolutely, but it's really difficult to get away with that for over 50 years. Yeah. So he was either really lucky or more clever than we think. But just a terrible, tragic case. Something I'd never heard of, and just was looking for Australian crimes and thought, this is quite a thing that I've never heard of. No one's ever recommended it or mentioned it. It is an interesting case, that's for sure. It's exceptional in a horrible way. Okay, so before we go on to feedback, I'm just going to remind all of you that you can send us an email to truecrimebrewery at tigrabber.com or leave us a voicemail from your phone or computer by clicking on the link in our show notes or going to our website, tigrabber.com. You can also help out the show by leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to our podcast. We also have an option for our listeners to get ad-free versions of our episodes and get our members-only bonus episodes by subscribing at tigrabber.com forward slash subscribe or on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash tigrabber. However it is that you support us, we appreciate you and we thank you for being here with us at the quiet end.
It's time for listener feedback. So we got a couple of feedbacks to do today, of course. I got a couple of voicemails that have uh, actually three case suggestions, and then we have a regular old email, also with a case suggestion. Okay. Well, let's listen to our voicemails. First, let's listen to a voicemail by Samantha, who has a case recommendation. She does. Hi, Jill. Hi, Dick. My name is Samantha Dockery. I've been listening to you for a while now. And I love your podcast. I think you some um, notes, and, but not really done a voicemail. I just, Jill, I just, I'm in love with you, darling. I really am. I just, the way that you talk and everything, you just, mm, I could eat you up. Anyway, uh, I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee, and there is a case there of the Christian Newsom murders. And it was probably the worst thing that had happened in Knoxville. Uh, you might check into it. It was very graphic and very horrifying, though, what they did to two teenagers. Uh, anyway, I love what you do. Please keep doing it. Well, gosh, thank you, Samantha. Yeah, this case has been suggested before. Oh, has it? I don't remember it. And I, I can't remember who suggested it. Otherwise, I would have made a note. Sure. But, yeah, this is a horrible crime. Uh, Shannon and Christopher were dating... So this was a boy and a girl? A boy and a girl. In high school? Uh, yeah. Early, early college, I think. Were they 18? 18, 19, 20 years old. Okay, so young. They were going to a friend's house. This was uh, 15 years ago. They got carjacked and get taken to a vacant house. They're beaten. They're raped. They're murdered. Just Awful. A horrible crime. That's just terrible. And there were four people involved. That's just so fucked up. What is wrong with people? That's what, well, I know I ask you that every day. We watch the news. I say, what is wrong with people? But really, what is wrong with people? If anyone knows, let me know. And thank you, Samantha. We're going to look into that for certain. And we'll find out who else recommended it as well. Because they always like to give credit to the first person that recommends things. So let's listen to another voicemail. This one's from Elizabeth, and she's going to share two case recommendations little bit longer voicemail here. Hi, Dick and Jill. I'm a true crime junkie. I love your podcast and I've referred so many people your way. I have two case suggestions. The first one is a Dr. Christopher Dunch, D-U-N-T-S-C-H. He was a neurosurgeon with the Baylor Plano in Plano, Texas. He eventually got involved with drugs, and he had performed like 38 surgeries in two years. 31 surgeries left the patients paralyzed or severely injured, and two of that 38 surgeries, the patients died. He was eventually convicted and sentenced to life in prison. The second case is uh, Earl Taylor in Terre Haute, Indiana. And his first wife died in a drowning in the bathtub in 1975. And his second wife, he remarried, and his second wife died in a car accident in a pond in 1988, 87 or 88. And he was convicted in killing his second wife and sentenced to 60 years in prison. But he only served around 26 years. And in that time, Cold Justice did an episode in 2014 about his first wife. Earl Taylor was eventually released from prison in January of 2014 and was rearrested in July of 2014, 41 years after his first wife's death. He was uh, convicted and sentenced to life in prison without parole. On the beer suggestions, Terre Haute, Indiana has a Terre Haute Brewing Company. They have um, beers called Mango Tango and Duality that you might be interested in. And that's about it. Thought I'd let you know. I appreciate your everything you guys are doing because I love the podcast. Have a good day. Thanks a lot, Elizabeth. Those are great case recommendations. Now, the doctor, that has been recommended a few times. 
and it's something that we're definitely interested in covering on an episode. There's so much about it. There was, I think it was a Peacock series we watched, which was excellent. I think we've talked about it before with Christian Slater, and Mm -hmm. I can't think of the guy who played uh, Dunch now, but what a shocking story that is. I was actually looking, and the American Board of Neurology had put out a statement about him, you know, very apologetic and taking some responsibility, which surprised me. Oh, yeah, that would. Yeah, they'd actually described uh, Dr. Dunch as a tragedy involving serious institutional failures at hospitals that allowed him to continue to operate even after many horrible outcomes and behavioral red flags. And this was another case, too, where the hospitals just kind of passed him on to the another one. Yeah. Yeah, so fascinating. We do love to do anything with medicine because Dick is so brilliant with that stuff. So I'm sure we will cover that. So thank you for recommending that. Now, as far as Earl Taylor, I had never heard of this one before. Had you, Dickie? I hadn't. And it's just fascinating. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of Drew Peterson. You know, the serial wife killing in the bathtub and all that. Yes. Although the first one is the bathtub. The second right, one, right. driving into a pond. But the first one, he claimed that she was in the tub in a radio fell into the tub and electrocuted her. That is so lame. Isn't that lame? It is, because it actually doesn't happen that way. There's, there's not enough electricity in a regular old radio to kill someone in a tub. Right, but he got away with that for years. He got away with that for years until he killed his second wife, and that got recognized. Mm-hmm. And that, then they as, looked into the other homicide. Death. Yeah, then they... There's a combination of things. One, one was that he couldn't keep his mouth shut, so he's bragging to his cellmates about his first wife. Okay. Well, that was stupid. Yeah. And also, just he's been married twice. He's had two wives die with an involvement of water. Yeah. Accidental, apparently. Yeah. yeah. So, he wasn't as smart as he thought he was. Oh, gosh. They never are, are they? Murderers no, are they stupid. Are. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. We have an email. We do have one email. And this is from Army for Life. It's a case suggestion. And Army for Life writes, One more case. The tragic evil murder of the beloved Oregon chef Dan Brophy. His vindictive wife of 24 years, Nancy Brophy, who for some delusional reasoning fancied herself as some type of romance suspense writer. Her books were straight up trash. (laughs) She was self-published. Her only fan was her husband but she murdered him at his job in the kitchen. That old saying, money is the root of all evil, well, it was definitely true in this case. Multiple life insurance policies, yet they were struggling to pay their mortgage sometimes, sometimes not even having enough money to pay the mortgage, but Nancy made sure she paid over $1,000 for life insurance on her husband. So there's a red flag. That's a rather large red flag. Yes. I think she had several policies that were cumulatively about a million dollars. And this was an older woman who should have known better. Yeah. Yeah. Should have. One of the ways that they started looking at her, one of her books or manuscripts was How to Murder Your Husband. Right. And there was a (laughs) Lifetime movie about it. I can't think of the name of it. Do you remember? No. No. But, you know, it makes for a good Lifetime movie for certain it is. kind it, of story. Who? Sybil Shepherd and who? I don't know. I didn't watch it. I just heard about it. But it was fairly recent, I guess. Yeah. I think Sybil was obviously Nancy Brophy. Yeah, I haven't seen Sybil Shepherd in years, so I wonder what she looks like now. Well, I'll have to tune into that one. Yeah, let's do it. So thank you for that case suggestion as well. So Dickie and I have been watching the Murdoch trial. And yesterday, we were hearing some rough testimony by the pathologist. She was fascinating. I just like the way that she went through everything. Very matter of fact, she'd done over 5,000 autopsies in her career. But it was brutal stuff. Really hard for the jury to look at. i bet. Yeah. So she went over all the injuries to Paul and Maggie. Now, Paul, the shot had gone under towards the back of his head and took off the back of his head pretty much, just leaving his face and his forehead. And there's some really horrible things about it I won't go into, but I did hear that a lot of people in the jury, a lot of the jurors had trouble watching this and seeing these pictures. Of course, to the pathologist, this was just her job and she didn't make much of it. 
but it was some shocking stuff. They didn't show the pictures on television when they're airing the trial, but just hearing about it was quite shocking. And then I wondered, well, why didn't the defense stop this from being shared? I think they could have. But what I've heard from the various podcasts and shows I've been watching on this is that the defense wanted these horrible pictures to come out and be seen because their whole defense is that Alec Murdoch was too much in love with his wife and too caring of his son. Why would he do such a horrible murder just over having money troubles? That's basically their defense, is that he has no motive here. Well, it doesn't sound like a real great defense. <laughs> it really doesn't, because you don't have to prove a motive. But, you know, on the other hand, most of the evidence is circumstantial, but heavy, a lot of it. Still haven't heard a lot of straight-up, direct evidence. But from the testimony we've heard, it's really leaning toward him being guilty. Um, done some YouTube surveys for fun and found that over 60% of people watching the trial believe he's guilty. But, you know, the defense hasn't presented their side yet, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. So if any of you have been watching this too and would like to give me your opinion, we'd love to hear. We'll talk about it next time on Feedback. Has the prosecution rested or are they still going? They haven't rested. This morning, which is Tuesday, they were still talking to the uh, pathologist. She was being cross-examined by the defense attorney. But she's just something else because she's so blasé about it all. And not in a mean way, but you can just tell that this is not shocking to her. She's been doing this for years. And I always wonder, how do you do a job like that and still feel normal? And yeah, she right. seems normal, but so disturbing. I just can't imagine. They also had just released a video of the um, body cam footage from the first responder policeman on the scene. So it's really kind of fun to look at his body language, the things he says. Of course, our body language experts on YouTube, I love to watch that. They have a whole episode on it. So if you've got some time to spare and you're a true crime addict, it's some interesting stuff to take a look at for certain. Yeah, I know that... Uh... I'll be sitting out here working with you and you'll be tuned into that. And I keep interrupting what I'm doing to check out your, <laughs> your screen. Yeah, it's just fascinating to me. That's my kind of thing. But I'm sure a lot of our listeners feel the same way or they wouldn't be listening to True Crime Brewery now, would they? That's true. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for listening to us and for joining us at The Quiet End. We appreciate you so much. And we will see you next time at The Quiet End. We'll save some seats. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.